All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, got a mystery guest for us here today. Really, really, really excited. Uh, Ian, uh, you, you ready for this? I'm excited for this one, man. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've heard this pretty smart guy we're talking to. Uh, very entertaining. Um, apparently a very good-looking man, uh, if you believe the, believe the people on the Twitter machine. Quite an impressive individual. I'm excited to talk to him today. And, of course, we've taken it too far. Let's just get into this now. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Now entering the nexus of geekery and guy world in three, two, one, mark. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? This is the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. Presented by IJMBooks.com. Hey, kids, as Ian likes to say, I hope things are going well for you today. As you can tell, starting off the podcast today, it is the one, the only, Dave Daniels. Uh, we have a very, very special guest today, as we alluded to earlier, a mystery guest indeed. I'm hoping I hit all the right buttons. Uh, Ian, uh, I, I know you're sitting back there. I, I'm hoping I've got all the music going right, everything's sitting the way it needs to. Does dude, it sound good so far? Dude, you sound like a seasoned pro. I kid oh, you not, I'm beyond impressed with you right now. That is a dazzling, <laughs> dazzling, picturesque display of what a podcast open should sound like, sir. Well done. Uh, I have tried. I have tried. Uh, I practiced. Uh, man, I can't tell you how many times I went through. Even got my name wrong twice. So, you know, <laughs> working on it a little bit. Practicing uh, in front the, of the mirror, are we? I have. I have. And I forgot my headphones one time, so I had to go back and get those again. It just It's so weird. Kind of need those. Uh, for those of you that can read the introduction coming in, obviously today is going to be a special day. Uh, I'm going to be doing the interview for today, but that's not why it's special. It's special because we get to talk about something brand new, and uh, the main man, the guy that's usually on the microphone doing all of this, Mr. Ian J. Malone, is going to be talking to us today about his brand new book, uh, Detrim Vice City. Oh, wait, wait, it's me? Like, I'm it's, the interview? <laughs> well, I, I told you it was a mystery. <laughs> Oh, well, thanks, man. I'm, uh, I'm always happy to do these. I, I am. You know, writing is something that uh, is very near and dear to me. I've been doing it for quite a few years now, and uh, it's, it's a blast to have a show like this that we can come on and, and have fun. And, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things I love about this show is just how loose we are, um, you know, whether it's with interviewing other, other people, other authors, other celebs, or, or just ourselves. Uh, we tend to have fun with it. So of all the podcasts out there, if I could only pick one to do an interview on to pub my, my new book, this would be the one, bar none. And not just because well, it's mine. Well, we, we appreciate that. Uh, before we get started too much into it, let's get into what we normally talk about so that we can uh, get, let's say some stuff out of the way, but let's go ahead and get into what we're going on. Of course, uh, social media, you can always find us on Facebook at the Dudes in Hyperspace group. If you haven't been to the group and seen some of the the discussions that go on, lots of stuff get posted. And obviously, it's, it's we talk about three things. Uh geekery uh guy world and sports so anytime you want to get into all that we have all that going on dudes in hyperspace group uh twitter handle is going to be the hyper dudes of course the three of us that are on the show mr ian j malone his handle is very easy in that it's ian j malone uh scott esther uh, who is not going to be with us today uh he's got other other obligations and things going on uh it's going to be under at fungo bats and of course you can find me at at kane's fam tally uh, website's going to be dudesinhyperspace.com. If you want to email and get in on the, the dude mail segment, which we're going to have a little bit later on, a couple good things going on in there, dudesinhyperspace at gmail.com. And now we can get into the interview itself. You <laughs> way to pay those bills good, sir. IJMBooks.com is very proud to be a presenting sponsor on this fine podcast. <laughs> there you go. See, you gotta you got to push it through and go into it. All right, so... Now, obviously, uh, you and I have been friends for a very long time, so I have gotten into and been on the front end of all of this, uh, was there, helped out with some of the books, have read all of the books that you have put out, uh, not only because I'm a fanboy, uh, but also because they're good books. You know, it, it's fun. You and I have known each other, so we have a lot of the similar interests. So I've gotten into really understanding where these characters are and see where they end up going into. Uh, you know, when it comes down to what you've got going on, the new book is Detrim Vice City, which is a, a book focused around more Detrim City Dan Vice. Yeah. Detrim. Detrim City. See? And there it is. <laughs> there it is. That's what happens when you type the wrong way. Hey, man, in your defense, you've uh, you, you've been at this radio thing uh, for you for a while, but, um, you know, you're, you're a little rusty. I understand that. I get it. it 
It happens from time to time. Uh, it, but the book <laughs> itself is focused more on on Danny Tucker and where Danny is then after the original trilogy. Yeah. Uh, of course, Danny's my favorite character, so I was really excited when this when this book specifically came out. But obviously, uh, you're, you're also a when you, when you got to get into the bio part of your of your what you got going on. Uh, you are the best selling author of the Mako verse, which involves uh, the trilogy of Mako, Red Sky Dawning, and At Circles End. You've written another book called Colonies Lost, which is honestly when when you sent that one to me. I'm a sci-fi guy to a little bit, but that book really stood out for me going through. is is just a great story. You've also written in the Four Horsemen universe uh, with Chris Kennedy and the guys that we've had on a little bit going from there. So, as we step forward and look at what's coming up next, let's talk a little bit about your end of it. What got you started writing the original trilogy for Make for the Makeoverse? Yeah, well, that's a very simple answer. I was bored to tears. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, I started writing the first Mako, I guess it was around 2009, late 2009, somewhere along in there. So uh, we were right in the middle of the Great Recession. Um, I was not at the greatest of places. I was uh, had just dropped out of doctoral school at Florida State because when the economy tanked, one of the first things to go in terms of budget cuts was the doctoral student stipends. And uh, given that uh, I was in the middle of a divorce at the time and had no income, that was kind of the only money I had coming in. So uh, when, when they announced that at Florida State, I was like, okay, well, I, I got to get out and find a real job so I can support myself. So, you know, for the next, you know, really year, all of my, anybody who was around that was unemployed at that time remembers just how bad it was. Um, really, for the better part of the next year, I, vast majority of my days were spent writing cover letters and resumes. And you know, that was it. It was every day, you know, hitting, hitting the boards of hotjobs.com and monster.com and all those relics of days gone by to try and find jobs and find one that looks even remotely like what you do, get the info, fill out the resume and the cover letter, fire it off, follow up, see if you can dig up contacts. I mean, grind, 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 grind. So, you know, I finally hit a place with that after several months of doing that with no returns whatsoever. I was just like, man, I got to have an outlet. Like I need something else to do here that can occupy my time and, and can just be a sounding board for maybe some of the stuff that's bouncing around in my brain right now, whether it's, you know, coping with issues, problems, emotions, things that I'm dealing with, with, with where I'm at in life at the moment. Um, or, you know, just a safe space, you know, safe space to play where I can, um, can imagine these cool things like starfighters and, and what people would talk about and what that would sound like and look like. And, and I just, I just need a way to vent. And I had this goofy story in mind about a group of bar buddies from Florida State who play a video game on Friday nights because they're all in their 30s, living in different cities. Life has not panned out at all for the way any of them had hoped in terms of careers, family life. They're all, it's not to say that they're busts at life, but it just, we all, I mean, just about all of us know that. I mean, how many people actually have a degree that's in the field that they work in right now? So we all kind of go through that adjustment period where we have to shift gears and find something, some way to reinvent ourselves. That's very much at the heart of where these characters were when you first start Mako. Well, that was me through and through, whether it was Lee Summerston, whether it was Evelyn McKenzie. I mean, there, there are sprinkles of me and my history and all of those characters. And uh, so I wrote it. And, I, you know, six months I looked up and I, I had a very, very nasty looking first draft. And but I liked it. And I, I let a good friend of ours, uh, Chris, who's, who's down in Orlando now, read over it. And he was like, you know what, man, it's definitely rough around the edges, but there's some magic in this. And so I, you know, started looking around, scouring the internet for, for people who actually knew how to make a book. You know, I had written some words on a page and I didn't know jack squat about how to make it look or format it or anything like that. And I figured, well, I'd, they say I need editing, so let me go find that. So I outsourced to some editors and got it polished up, shopped it around. Nobody was really interested in, in uh, you know, in, in grabbing it. So I said, well, you know what, I'm, this was never a, a, a business thing. This was never meant to be a side hustle thing. This was a creative outlet at a time in life when I needed it most. But I want to put it out there. So I had heard about this indie publishing thing on Amazon where they'll let you publish your own books. And I thought, well, screw it. I'm going to go ahead and just put it out. And if people buy it and I can make a couple of bucks off of it, then great. But at the end of the day, I just hope people enjoy reading this as much as I enjoyed writing it. Because it meant the world to me. Um, you know, the story, the characters, there's, there's so much of me in there. It's absurd. And so I did, and I put it out on Amazon. And then I looked up one morning, and it was in the top five for sci-fi. 
And I, I mean, I'll never forget that day calling my, you know, my wife now into the room. I'm like, honey, <laughs> you'll never believe what happened to me today to borrow the line <laughs> from Jack Nicholson. And, uh, and Mako went on to do exceptionally well for an indie in, in, in sales. And that allowed me to then go back in and hire editors and cover designers to, to take what I had learned about crafting a book and cash flow the rest of the trilogy, which inevitably became the, you know, the Mako saga. Um, you know, the, the one thing that, um, and I, I'm really thankful to Chris Kennedy and the folks over at Theogony Books for kind of letting me correct this. You know, the, the one regret I have is with the original saga is that I was just a little bit too slow in cranking out the stories. I was still learning how to write like all writers. You're, you're, you get better at your, like anybody with a craft, you get better at it. The more that you do, you get more efficient, you refine your process, how you develop things, how you build world, how you build characters, how you build story. And, you know, on average, I was cranking out, you know, a book every two, two and a half years. And in today's world of publishing, like, you just can't do that. You, you got to be ready to rock and roll. And so the other two books didn't really get found. Mako had cooled a bit too much for people to then go back and refine for books two and three. You know, fast forward to 2020, I re-released the entire trilogy with Chris Kennedy Publishing, and it's found a whole new readership that it never had before. And that gave us some really great momentum heading into Detron City Vice, which, as you noted at the top of the show, um, went live yesterday to the world, and it's now out there for people to go get. So that's really kind of how the, I got started as a writer and, uh, and really what the, the genesis of the Mako Saga was. was, it, was uh, it was something that I enjoyed doing. It was an outlet for me. Uh, it was a way for me to kind of vent some stuff out and uh, kind of clear my head, clear my chest, and, um, but in the process, I was really proud of this cool little story about these five really family, like this little crew, you know, I mean, as the renegades are still to date of all the characters I've written, they are still my favorite because they are based off of so much reality. And the people who know me, who know where I came from, know where, you know, you know, who know me, they, uh, there's a lot about the renegades that are very familiar. So that's how it all got started, man. <laughs> what about, uh. With everything else you got going on, and obviously I know a little bit more about what you what you do and what you get into, but why why did you decide to use sci-fi as that vehicle instead of say westerns? Because I know at some point in time you were really into westerns and you, sure. you read like a lot of Louis L'Amour and that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, well I mean that was you know you noted Colonies Lost. Um, I, that was really in a lot of respects my homage to to Louis L'Amour, you know of a of a frontier type of story with um, uh, you know with with people really. Uh, they have to survive by their own wits. You know, it's, it's humanity at its best when its back is against the wall and they've, you know, they've got to survive. That's in a lot of respects the you know, the story of, of Colonies Lost. Um, you know, it's told through the lens of a modern day U.S. Marshal uh, who just kind of happens upon this for a number of different reasons. Some of them are accidental, some of them are not. But inevitably he finds the descendants of the lost colony of Roanoke Island. And you get to find out, you know, what happened to those folks and what's happened in the, you know, 300 years since they vanished from what is now the Outer Banks area of North Carolina. But, um, but a lot of, lot of tropes there from, from old Louis L'Amour books, you know, the, the pioneers, the big players, the titans of industry, you know, the, the people who figure out very early on, I'm going to find my niche of what's a need right now, whether it's transportation, whether it's communications, whether it's fuel, you know, and, and I'm going to stake my claim on that. And that's where I'm going to build my fortune. That's how I'm going to build my legacy. Colonies Lost tackles a lot of that, just like an old Louis L'Amour book would. So anyway, that was, uh, that was that, but getting back to, um, kind of my, my influences and why sci-fi, because, you know, I really didn't become a voracious reader until my thirties. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I love Louis L'Amour so much is because it was one of the few quality fiction things that you could get on book on tape whenever I was a kid growing up, you know, I'm legally blind. So for me, there, you know, the option of just grabbing your favorite paperback off the shelf and plopping down on a couch on a nice rainy day with a hot cup of coffee, that didn't exist for me because I can't read those books. I am all audio. That's how I consume all of my you know, luxury reading, whether it's the daily news or whether it's social media or whether it's reading a book. And growing up, there just weren't a whole lot of options. It was what you had on cassette through the local public library. There was no Audible. There was no iTunes. There was no any of that. So you were extremely limited on what you could get. And I can remember some of the big books that I read when I was a kid were The Hunt for Red October from Clancy, which was way over my head at the time, Jaws from Peter Benchley. And I read that just because I love the movie growing up, Spielberg flick. And then uh, you had Louis L'Amour. And so 
that was it. You know, it wasn't until I hit 30 in the advent of the iP- you know, the, the iPod, where you could literally carry an entire library around in your pocket, that I just blasted open reading. And at that part, I, I mean, I was reading everything. I was reading everything from John Sanford and the Prey series with Lucas Davenport and that whole crew to old school Stephen King, like The Dead Zone, uh, still one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, the Shining, also another good one, obviously. Um, you know, really got hooked into the Jonathan Mayberry stuff with the Joe Ledger series. Uh, naturally, being an, an old school Star Wars fan, I was finally able to jump into the expanded universe, and I ripped into that. Uh, I read dozens and dozens of, of the old, what is now Star Wars Legends, whether it was the, the original Heir to the Empire trilogy from Timothy Zahn, which for you know decades stood as the original episodes, you know, seven, eight, nine. Um, you know, I read the Revan was a fantastic one. Kenobi from John Jackson Miller was a great one, all of that stuff. But as far as why sci-fi, that's because of the stuff I grew up watching as a kid. Star Wars is literally the first film I remember watching. I vaguely, vaguely, vaguely remember, uh, I guess Empire Strikes Back is probably the first film I remember watching, uh, because it was 1980. I vaguely remember sitting in a theater with my dad, uh, watching that film. And then as I got a little bit older, I went back and watched them all on what was then Laserdisc and then eventually VHS over and over and over again. That was uh, when I was a kid going over to the neighbor's house. I remember he had two movies, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Star Wars. So you always know what one with me. Yeah, I was probably six or seven Chitty at the time. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, of course. Chitty Chitty, Chitty Bang Bang, that's right. So, uh, I mean, anyway, but you know, then moving on through there, man, you know, 1987 hits and you've got. Star Trek, uh, the next generation, which I was an avid fan of because I loved all the old movies, you know, Wrath of Khan, Search for Spock, all of that. Um, you know, so then you get into Star Trek for years with TNG, DS9, Voyager, then finally Enterprise, um, you know, Firefly rolls around in, in the late two or, you know, early two thousands. I found that like everybody else on DVD, Babylon five, Battlestar Galactica, um, you know, all of this stuff, space above and beyond, pretty much if it had spaceships in it, I would give it a shot. And that has always been my MO. So when the time came to write, there was no denying that sci-fi was going to be the genre that I was going to write in, period. Now, we, we've talked a little bit, obviously, about the influences and what you've gotten into going back and forth. And, and you know, we joke back and forth I about, you know, uh, some of the stuff that we went through, some of the movies we got going back and forth. But, I mean, it always appears as though that you're just out of a, a terrorist following off Nakatomi and a, uh, and a cigarette away from being <laughs> full-on 80s, 90s. So, you know, you, you hit a little bit about those those movies, the 80s, the 90s, the stuff that you grew up watching. But is there one specific, uh, other than Star Wars or, you know, the what, what specific movies did you use as influences when you kind of came in... Um, to get into this stuff. It very, it really varies from story to story and book to book. Uh, Mako, listen, it's no surprise that that book draws so many comparisons to the last starfighter. Well, duh. Last starfighter was one of my favorite films as a kid. You know, I mean, my dad recorded that on VHS tape off network television so I could watch it or off of, um, HBO. Actually, we had a, a friend who had HBO. And so he recorded that for me and he would like, um, my dad would go in and like self edit, the, uh, the scene where the kid's opening up like a playboy and all of that. Because I'm like seven at the time. He didn't really want to. So what is porno, Dad? He, like My dad was smarter than me. He knew now is not the time to have that discussion. So, you know, I would sit around and watch Last Starfighter all day long with the occasional, you know, glitch of digital static where my dad had gone in and editing, edited something that he didn't want me to see at the time. So anyway, but, you know, Last Starfighter, Star Wars, you know, it a, make out a very Star Warsian feel to it with a twist of Last Starfighter. Um, you know, I, I tell people it was it was billed actually by Chris Kennedy as Last Starfighter meets Band of Brothers. Um, you know, I think that's very apropos. Uh, the Last Starfighter influences are very well chronicled for that book. But, you know, the Band of Brothers thing, that is something that I think resonates in just about everything that I do. This notion of family, of crew, of honor, of loyalty. You know, those are, those are traits that I very much, um, I'm very fortunate to have grown up and been raised by parents that really beat that into me as a sense of, uh, of integrity and, and identity. And then I was very fortunate to, to become good friends with people throughout the course of my life who held those same values. So, you know, 
loyal people rising up doing the right thing for the right reasons just to help their fellow man sticking by each other through thick and thin jump you know brother jumping in front of a bullet for another brother i mean that's you know that's very much ingrained in you know in the way i was raised and so that manifests itself in a lot of the the characters that i write mako you're dealing with a crew um colonies lost not so much that was more of a trip hackett is very much a loner character um, who finds community in a very unlikely of places, but has walked a good chunk of his life feeling like very much an outsider. So that was kind of different in that regard. But then, you know, you jump to Freebird Rising in the Four Horsemen universe. Again, it's about family. It's about culture. It's about sticking up for your people and, um, you know, and, and back in your brother's play, no matter what, and staying by each other. You know, those themes all all resonate somehow in the vast majority of what I do just because I enjoy telling those kinds of stories. And it's one of the reasons why I signed on with Chris Kennedy Publishing, honestly. And you heard that when, when we interviewed him here on this podcast. He said, you know, I just enjoy reading stories about good people who do good things just for no other reason than because it's right. I, you know, particularly now in this day and time when everything sucks so much, it's so nice and refreshing to fall back into a story that's just about good people doing the right things by other people. And, um, you know, I very much pride myself on putting a lot of that into my writing. And, you know, that's why they're such a wonderful press to partner with on these, because that's in so much of what they do, whether it's the 4HU, whether it's the Salvage Universe from uh, from Kevin Steverson, whether it's the Fallen World Universe from Christopher Woods, um, you know, that those sorts of themes really resonate throughout a lot of the CKP portfolio. And I'm really, really happy to be a part of that. I think that fits me and what I do and my brand very, very well. All right, so let's get into the whole reason why we're doing the podcast now. Now that we've gone into this, so let's <laughs> talk about the foundation the, lead. Let's let's talk about the new book. All right, so the new book. I obviously don't want to give too much away, but let's let's give a little bit of a summary without giving too much away to get people. Let's give them that hook. Let's pull them in. Yeah. So uh, really, it's Miami Vice in space. When you get right down to it, if I if I've got an elevator pitch to give, that's it. Um, This is, for the people who have read the Mako Saga books, this is a a very proper book four. It is set five years after the events of At Circle's End. Um, For people who have not read the Mako books, this is very much a new starting place. So if you've never plugged into this series, you saw the cover for Detron City Vice and you thought, wow, that looks different. I might ought to read that. You do not have to have read Mako at Circle's End or Red Sky Dawning to be able to follow Detron City Vice. It is very much intended to be kind of its own book one, if you will. Um, says very clearly there at the top of the uh, top of the cover, this is a Mako Universe novel. The others say Mako Saga book one, two, and three. This is not a saga book. It is, um, it, is, it is meant to be very much a Danny Tucker story. But again, if you've read the other books, you're going to be able to have a lot, of, a lot of the backstory. You'll probably pick up on some inside jokes that other people who haven't read, uh, read those books will not. Um, but, you know, yeah, it, it is, in a lot of respects, it is Miami Vice in space. And that is um, really kind of a far more organic thing than I think a lot of people might initially expect. You know, Danny Tucker, right out of the gate in Mako, um, Link Baxter loves to, to nickname him Crockett, calls him Crockett, and has for years and years and years since they went to college together. It's because Danny Tucker is a good-looking guy who works in law enforcement, drives a sports car, dresses sharp, and uh, and just happens to be from Miami. So, Sonny Crockett. I mean, like, that's pretty much pretty apropos. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when I started to set out to write a Danny Tucker spinoff novel. And I kind of had an eye to do that when I wrote at circles in, which is why I took as much time as I did to kind of flesh out the overlook crew. Um, you know, I, I, I when I started to kind of, okay, well, how are we going to do this moving forward? What are we going to do? And the Crockett thing jumped into my mind and I thought, well, crap, Ola, let's tell a Miami vice story. And that is drugs, lots of action, Midnight shootouts and you know in the in the dead of night by some place with waterfront on it, fast cars, beautiful women, um, you know I mean it, it it's that's what it is. It's this kind of gritty underworld style of tale, as opposed to the saga books, which were much more classic space opera. It's fleets, it's starfighters, it's all of that. Veteran City Vice is very much more of a boots on the ground style of book. It shifts gears from space opera to still being very sci-fi, but almost kind of skewing more towards a police procedural, and that is because Danny Tucker is an ex-cop. 
And so, you know, what better way to put him back in his element than to give him a case to solve? And so, you know, it starts out with Danny is, is very much um, kind of where you expected he would be after the events of At Circle's End. He's still hanging out with the Overlook crew. They're trying to figure out what life looks like in peacetime. You know, there is no war. The war is over. So they're trying to make it as, as you know, as honest businessmen. You know, they're, they're running a transport ship, hauling cargo wherever they can to and from just to make money to pay their bills and do what they've got to do. And, you know, just after the, you know, the, the run opens the book, he gets a call from Link Baxter who says, listen, I've got a, you know, a friend whose kid has managed to get himself in a little bit of trouble and we think you can help. And so that's really kind of the jumping off point of, um, you know, of, of Detron City Vice. The other thing that is very different about this book is the world of the Makoverse is, a, is a, the landscape of the Makoverse is a very different place. Uh, you know, as mentioned a second ago, this book is set during peacetime. You know, the war between Alistair and Aura consumed so much of the oxygen of um, of what the saga was. You know, the blood feud between the, you know, the ancestors and, and their relatives. It's, you know, it's really kind of a generational thing. You know, this happens at a time when all of that has, for all intents and purposes, been settled. You have the Auron Alliance. You have what is now the Alistairian Union. All right. Very much uh, kind of in the vein of Germany post-World War II. You know, Alistair was a world that wasn't necessarily, you know, they, they were a group that were not necessarily bad people. They were everyday human beings, just like you and me. You know, they just got into trouble with who they let take over their society. Um, and again, you know, demo your World War II history. Anybody who knows that era knows exactly how all of that went down. The wrong people got in charge, and that took Alistair down a very dark path. Well, this is beyond that now. So, you know, in an effort to try and bridge the gap with, you know, with the quadrant at large and, and kind of hit a bit of a restart button to build some trust with their neighbors, the empire was dissolved. When Lucius Zire turned, you know, went back to, to being the chancellor, the first thing he did was say, we're dismantling the empire. So all of you, you know, worlds and star systems and people who were essentially forced into joining us by the previous regime, you were annexed in and essentially forced at gunpoint to join the empire and start giving us your tax money, giving us your resources. Um, you know, you are free to walk if you want. We would certainly welcome you to stay. You will be afforded all the same rights and privileges that worlds in the core systems are allowed. But if you just don't trust us, then you are free to leave and go your own way. Godspeed, we wish you well. Nobody here is going to stop you. So, you know, there were a lot of worlds that took Lucius at his word on that because they trusted him. He's, he's regarded as a guy that is one of the good guys. And so they stuck around. Some, some worlds, some star systems didn't. They left. They said, we're, you know, we're going to the Oran side of the coin. We're going to join the Alliance, and we're going to be part of that. But you also had this group of star systems, there were about 13 of them, who said, screw both of you guys. All right, the Iron Alliance, the Alistairian, what is now the Alistairian Union, are what's referred to as the prime territories in the Makoverse. This group of star systems broke off and said, we're done with both of you. We don't like either of you. We don't trust either of you. Anytime the winds of war shifted, we were the people who were caught right in the middle. So anytime there was blowback, we were the first ones to pay the price because of your stupid-ass war. We're out. Peace. Just like a kid from Clerks 2. Peace out. I'm out of here. Um... So they split and break off and form their own group called the League of Independent Worlds. And that's where all of this starts. That's where Detron City is. We were introduced to Detron City and Red Sky Dawning. And now it is back in full bloom because it has joined this new group that essentially has very little law and limitations on its members. They have no centralized government. The, the, ver the biggest tenet of what they are is we, uh, we respect the sovereignty of, of our member worlds. However you want to run your world is your business. Your wars, your problems, your cultural disputes, that's all your business. Nobody's going to come intervening in any, any of that. You mind your own business. We're going to mind ours as long as we all abide by a basic defense pact and a trade pact so we can all make money and jumpstart commerce out here. We're going to be fine. That is the world that is Detron City. And it is the face of this new group, the League of Independent Worlds. And for all intents and purposes, it is Las Vegas meets Amsterdam. It's glitz, it's glamour, it's lights, it's neon. Um, it's, if you're over in Dreamland District, it's parties and clubs galore. Um, it's Amsterdam in that you can get into pretty much anything you want, if you so choose, because it's all legal. So, you know, while you can make a lot of money in the League of Independent Worlds, there's also a lot of seediness out there. 
that you can get into if you're not careful and you know where to look. That is the setting that this story takes place in. You know, getting back to Danny Tucker, Link Baxter's buddy whose kid has gotten into trouble, that is the world that he has found himself in. And that's what Danny has to go infiltrate and learn is, you know, who are the major players? What is happening here? You know, there is a drug that is now a designer drug that is now really, you know, it's it's all over the bog, the League of Independent Worlds, but now it's starting to turn up in the civilized world and people aren't too thrilled about that. So how is he going to respond? What will he have to unearth in order to get to the bottom of all this to not only find the kid, but stop a brand new interplanetary dispute from breaking out between the primes and the league of independent worlds. So like that wasn't at all the nutshell answer you were looking for, like not even close, (laughs) but, uh, but that is Detrin city vice. It's um, again, it's, it's make a book four for those who are looking for that for people who have never accessed the series. Uh, it's also a, a perfectly appropriate book one, but it is very different and it's going to offer a very different style of read for anybody who has read the Baco books or not. Well, you know, obviously listening to the answer and how you flesh that out and going through, you have a lot of passion about this universe itself and, and the writing process, but what, what, What has been the best part of, after a few years of really, other than doing some edits, not really writing these characters at all, what was the best part about picking those characters back up and going into it? Well, I mean, writing writing any of the Renegades, which are your core five, that's Lee Summerston, Danny Tucker, Evelyn McKenzie, uh, now Evelyn Summerston, uh, Link Baxter and Hamish Lundley. I mean, that's, that's that's the beginning of my writing career when it comes to fiction. Um, you know, I'd written for years prior to that for news and sports and public health and I still write in the science world for my day job. Um, But it, you know, as you mentioned, it had been years since I had climbed back into those characters. That's like going home. I mean, right in any of the renegades is literally, it is like taking a stroll right back down Tennessee street and Tallahassee, Florida, plopping down in AJ's sports bar, which no longer exists and getting an ice cold pint with a mushroom Swiss burger and watching some sports or maybe a wrestling pay-per-view on the big screen. Like it is old school homecoming, um, you know, that, that is what those books are for me. So going back to them is always a treat and it was time, you know, I needed a little bit of a break away from the Mako verse. It was the first thing I had ever written and I wanted to do some different stuff, which is why I went off. I did colonies lost. I did Freebird rising. I also dabbled in, in some other folks universe. Like I said, with the salvage stuff and the fallen world stuff. Um, you know, but I, but I hit a point right after I finished Freebird rising, when I said, okay, I got a couple of more short stories in front of me, and then it's time to get back to the Mako guys. You know, it's, it's been going on four years now since I've written those characters, written in that world, and I very much like going home. When I have not had a chance to board a plane for, for Tallahassee for a while, I start to jones for that. You know, I need a little bit more Whataburger in my life. You know, I need, I need my friends. I need Don't my people. All? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, you know, and, and writing that universe is very much that type of sensation. So, uh, you know, writing them and going back is never a hard thing for me to do, particularly when I've been away for a while. Um, you know, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this trip back into the Makoverse, though, was the chance to really clean up the universe and put it on a very clean slate and a very strong foundation moving forward. Um, you know, the, the upshot of writing for the first time is it's such a thrill and everything is a learning experience from the way you build world to the way you craft characters to it's all new and it's all exciting and it's all fresh and you learn so much. Downside is you also make a lot of mistakes and it's not the, you know, the cleanest stuff in the world because you're still learning how to do what you do. Uh, you know, and again, I, I'm very grateful to the folks over at CKP for letting me bring this saga to them because, you know, they helped me go back and fill in some of the cracks and clean up some of the, you know, little errors in world or what have you that I had made along the way. Detrin City Vice resets the game and really puts the makeoverse on a great foundation moving forward, whether it's, you know, the way I kind of cleaned up the the worlds and the quadrant and really put a, a clear identity on who Aura is, who Alistair is, who the League is. Um, the tech, the ships, the way I, you know, name things, it's all very purposeful now. And that wasn't always the case. There were some aspects of the Makoverse when I was first getting started as a rookie that were a little bit messy. And now I get to go back and really clean all that up. And it's like putting a fresh coat of polish on a beautiful car before you roll it out of the garage. Now she's cherry. Now she looks fantastic. And it is my hope that that is what Detrin City Vice is 
is, you know, it is me going back to a world that I love very much and means so much to me with characters who mean the world to me and really getting to, to put my skills as a storyteller and as a writer to work here in the now, you know, to borrow a line from Spaceballs, we're at now, now, and I'm a much better writer than I was when I wrote Mako. And it is my hope now that, that I get to really tell a Mako story with Vice and anything I write moving on from that, that, you know, that reflects my skills now with a world that I love very much. All right. So, uh, before we move on to uh, the dude mail section, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Malone, we hope you can stick around for our dude mail. Help us answer some of those questions. <laughs> Pretty sure I can do that. Yeah. I, just just hoping we can we can keep you for the entire time. I know your time is valuable here. Uh, what uh, what are you hoping uh, people get out of the books when they when they look at it? And, and give us a real quick why people should go out and read the book. Because they're a good time. You know, and I said this in uh, in the email that I sent out to all of my email news listers, um, which, speaking of, if you kind of really want the original genesis of the Mako series, that plays out in a short story called Mako Genesis that you can get for free when you sign up for my email newsletter. So go to ijmbooks.com, ianjmalone.net. We'll get you there, just the same, same website. Uh, right there on the very top of the homepage, you'll get a prompt. You get three short stories, a prequel for Mako, a prequel for Freebird Rising, and a prequel for Colonies Lost. So uh, anyway, everybody loves free stuff, man, so go get you some. Um, but uh, what was the question again? Because I brain farted oh, out, and apparently I didn't drink <laughs> enough coffee today. <laughs> uh, what, what do you hope people get out of the books? And uh, uh, you answered the first part of that being, well, why, why should people right. go pick it up? But uh. Yeah, no, I uh, and I said this to my newsletter people. Sorry, a, a senior moment there. Um, I hope people smile when they read this story, whether it's for the nostalgia. And listen, for the people who remember Miami Vice, there's going to be a lot about this that's very familiar. And that's by, that was by design. You know, I mean, I, heck, I even worked an 80s music pop soundtrack in there via one of the characters. And there's a reason why it's there. You know, it's, it's not just, hey, I'm going to drop some songs. Like for anybody who read At Circle's End, it's going to be a very natural, organic thing that there's 80s music pretty much playing on the ship throughout this entire story. Um, so enjoy that. But, you know, a lot of the tropes that I referenced earlier about, you know, the action and the cars and the fashion, that's all in there, but told within the fabric and the context of a Mako story. So, you know, whether it's for the nostalgia or the characters, you know, which I'm, uh, people really have seemed to latch on to, that's probably my favorite thing. The biggest accolade that I've gotten out of the Mako books that I, I'm so proud of is the fact that people love these characters as much as I do. So, you know, whether it's the nostalgia, whether it's the characters, whether it's the action, um, you know, we talked about Louis L'Amour earlier. One of the things I've always loved about Louis L'Amour books, particularly the Sackets, where they were tight reads, man. I mean, like 225, 250 pages, you could blaze through one of those in an afternoon on the couch. But, you know, it wasn't, you didn't, it wasn't like eating a candy bar. Like you felt like you really got good quality characters and great story. That's why Louis L'Amour is regarded as one of the master storytellers of our time for any genre. You know, if I, if I can, if, if I could be so bold, I really shot for that with Detron City Vice. It's the shortest book I've written at uh, just over 250 pages. But it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a rocket ship. I mean, it's, it hits the ground running and it does not stop. And based off of the early reviews, which have been great so far, um, people really love that about it. So, you know, back to answering your question a little bit more poignantly, I hope people have a good time with this book. There's so much crap in the world right now that just sucks. Whether it's quarantine, whether it's politics, whether it's having to wear one of these goofy looking masks everywhere you go, but you wear it because it's the right thing to do, even though you hate it, which is me. Um, there, there's so much about the world right now to be disenchanted with and any opportunity you can get to smile, whether it's because you just were ecstatic over the moon for the Mandalorian season two trailer or Cobra Kai is now on Netflix or whether it's reading this goofy little Miami Vice in space book, you know, I hope that it makes people smile. I hope that they have a good time when they read it. You know, by the time you turn the last page, hopefully you're chomping at the bit for more. And I've already got the next story mapped out. So, you know, you guys go out, you buy it. Please leave a review if you did enjoy the story and know that I'm well at work on the next one. Um, you know, but, but that's really my hope for people is that they just find a reason to smile at a time when there's a whole lot of people who just need that right now. And I hope this book brings it to them. I, I love entertaining people. You guys who know me on social media know that better than anybody, especially my friends and my people do. 
I love a good time. Whether it's having people over to my house for a, you know, a pile of smoked barbecue and a bunch of sides and watch a football game or hop on a boat and, uh, you know, raise one up in the hot sunshine out on the water or, um, you know, just, just getting together around a, you know, a, a bar somewhere and telling old stories about college or music or movies or what have you. I enjoy entertaining people. And whether that's at home on my home life or whether that's with the stories that I write, I want people to come right in, kick off their shoes, cozy up with a group of people that they know very well and just be able to smile for a while. That's what I hope they get out of Detron City Vice. And there you go. People go out and grab the book. Uh, Ian, let us know where you can get the book at this moment. Uh... Yeah, I mean, anything you need to know about me is on my website. So again, that's ianjmalone.net or ijmbooks.com. Again, they go to the same place. Uh, they're also on Amazon. Just run a search for Detron City Vice right there on the search bar, uh, and it'll take you straight to it. Uh, you can also check out chriskennedypublishing.com for not only all of my stuff, but all of the other exciting stuff that they got going over there. And uh, that guy, they're, they're like a machine over at that press. If you're a voracious reader, uh, they can keep up with you. And that is not something that can be said for a whole lot of publishers. Those guys are a lean, mean machine. So go uh, go check them out, whether it's the Four Horsemen Universe stuff or the, um, you know, the Fallen World stuff or the Salvage Universe stuff. They, you know, they really nail it over there. So proud to be a part of those folks. But, yep, Amazon, ianjmalone.net, right. it'll get you there. All right, Detron City Vice out this weekend, brand new, off the press. Uh, let's uh, Let's get out there. Let us know what's going on. If, if you get a chance to read the book, write us a dude mail question. Let us know what you think. If you have any specific questions about the book itself, obviously Ian's always on the show. He can bring you back through it. If you have any suggestions for him or going through it, feel free to, to email us at uh, dudesinhyperspace.com. You can head to our uh, our Facebook group as well. But uh, we appreciate you coming on to the show, Mr. Malone, and, and telling us all about your new venture. Dude, man, it was, uh, it was a treat, just as much as it was a treat to, to write it, man. Thanks for letting me take over our show to do this for, for a little while. It was fun. Absolutely. And now, and now we get to the other exciting part of what we do, where the guest gets to help us out with our dude mail questions. Uh, Garcon, uh, hit the dude mail question, please. <laughs> you got mail. All right, and now the segment that we always get into after we get done with our guest, dude mail questions. Uh, because I'm running the show, I'm reading them, so <laughs> Proceed, God help sir. us all. God help us all. All right, the first one comes from Sheldon. As a diehard Michigan fan and alum, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, uh, I'm beyond thrilled to see the Big Ten reverse course and move forward with the 2020 football season. It still doesn't change the fact that our entire conference looks like a pack of buffoons, but I digress. Uh, who's your pick to take the Big Ten this year, and what are the odds that we actually get a playoff? Uh, being our guest today, Mr. Malone, you may begin that question. <laughs> well, you know, uh, it, kudos to you, Big Ten, uh, and he's exactly right. You do look pathetic. You know, the Big Ten is always, and I'm, I'm sure we have Big Ten people listening who are going to be totally offended by this, and I'm just sorry. You're going to have to suck it up for a minute. Um, the Big Ten has always had this arrogance about them that, like, they feel that – they are the leaders of the college football landscape. And when we make a decision, everybody else is going to follow suit because that's the right thing to do for college football and the student athletes. Well, newsflash, a-holes, you're not the leaders. I know you tried to, <laughs> I know you tried to announce that while naming your divisions. What was it, eight, nine years ago? The leaders division and the legends division because there was no right. arrogance in that whatsoever. Um, we actually saw that you could indeed play college football safely. And as long as you took the right precautions and were smart about what you were going to do, uh, we in the Atlantic Coast Conference and the Southeastern Conference and the Big 12 had the foresight to be able to do that. So on behalf of all of the smart kids in the room, welcome to the party, <laughs> pal. Uh, as far as who's going to take the Big the Big 10, I mean, listen, until somebody knocks them off the perch, it's Ohio State's. And particularly yes. with, as long as they got Justin Fields under center. Like, that's <laughs> that's pretty much a no-brainer. And as long as Michigan's got Harbaugh, they're never going to be anything. So, uh, you know, they're, they're going to win nine games a year, and they're going to lose the games that actually matter, and then they'll be irrelevant and go to an Orange Bowl or something like that. And maybe they show up and play, maybe they don't. It's always a crap ship, uh, crapshoot under Harbaugh. But that's my take on the Big Ten. Yeah, pretty much Ohio State. I mean, there's, there's really nothing else to compete with them at the moment. Penn State's moving up. Hopefully, they'll, they'll be able to make some noise. Uh, you never know, especially with this year, with everything kind of going on and, and the lack of practice. Maybe you'll see a couple of upsets early that may help out things, but uh, more than likely, it's going to be Ohio State. Uh, uh, and, and, of course, uh, have we heard anything from the Pac-10 yet? Are they going to be or the Pac-12 or whatever? 
the I West Coast people? Are they they going to be doing this at all anytime soon? Uh, talk about leagues that are irrelevant because I really care if Oregon State's going <laughs> to play this year. Really, really. Um, right, yeah. Somewhere along the line, USC is supposed to be relevant. I don't know. I don't hear anything. Um, yeah. Last yeah. I heard, gonna... last I heard, they're still holding off until the spring, which. Um, you know, no loss. Uh, my man did ask if, if we think there's going to be a playoff. I don't think they're going to have one. And I honestly don't think that they should. You know, well, we're, all very, think... we're all very lucky to have our conference schedules. Let's just play those crown conference champions and roll on Big River to 2021, man. I, I think you're still going to have a playoff. Uh, I think they'll, they'll try to keep that as normal as possible. They'll do it in a bubble situation because you'll have the amount of uh, schools necessary where you can put them all in one place, keep them in, in a, a little area, play it over a two-weekend uh, – place the money's there uh you'll you'll have a little bit of fans they'll probably have it i I think it was scheduled to be in florida this year anyway so it's in a place where fans some fans can show up maybe we'll end up in something something i think we'll end up with a playoff this year we shall see second question is going to be from wilson hey guys thanks for the quick on the draw thanks for being see i and i'm just like the other guy that normally reads these i can't read either let's start that over wilson hey guys thanks for being quick on the draw to get the new mandalorian out to the facebook group uh, that totally made my week. What were your thoughts on the trailer on a scale of 1 to 10? How pumped are you for Season 2? Uh, as the, the host for today, I will uh, go ahead and pull that one first. Uh, you know, the thoughts on the trailer were there wasn't much to it, but you don't have to. Everyone loved what was going on. Give us a little bit of a taste, a little bit of what's what's there, enough to ask some questions. Not right. answer some questions, but ask some questions. Uh, I am pumped. I am on a scale of 11 for this. Uh, it, it's a great story. has been a great story. I'm extremely excited about what's going to happen, and uh, I will probably annoy the the hell out of my fiance by sitting on the couch that entire weekend and watching the entire thing. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. Uh, well, you won't be able to do that because sadly they only release them one a week. They don't do like Netflix and dump them all where you can binge them. You got to wait old school week to week to be able to watch the next episode. But um, that's good news for her. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Uh, I, on the other hand, am married to a woman who loves that sort of thing. So, uh, she will be right there on the couch with popcorn ready to roll right with me. Uh, and, and my kid too. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Dave nailed it. It's, um, they did a great job doing what a teaser trailer is supposed to do, which is tease, leave you with a whole bunch of questions so that you're continuing to ask, you know, to ask those questions moving forward and to want to stay locked in to see what, where they go with the story. Um, I love the fact that the armorer from season one narrated the entire thing. Her voice is amazing. I don't know who that is. Uh, I go on IMDb and look it up. I'm sure she sounds really familiar. Um, but I love that kind of the fact that beyond being an armorer, she's like this kind of sage advisor to someone who clearly has a, a you know really grounded understanding of what Mandalorian history is and what the the legacy of that people are. And for those of us who watch the Clone Wars and watch Star Wars Rebels, you know, we really have that. Um, to that end, you know, one, one thing I will say that I'm, I'm really kind of hoping they don't do. A lot of talk about uh, Ahsoka Tano coming in. Uh, we know that the guy who played Jango Fett in Attack of the Clones is going to be back for this. Now, whether or not he's going to be playing Boba Fett, whether or not he is going to be playing uh, Captain Rex from Clone Wars, who's always palled around with Ahsoka, their peas in a pod. Um, nobody really knows exactly what he is, what he's going to be doing, but there's a big school of thought out there that Sasha Banks from the WWE is going to be playing Sabine Wren. And for those who, who remember how Star Wars Rebels ended, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, um, you know, she's very closely tied to Ahsoka. So it, it, you know, it makes sense that those two could appear together. I really don't want to see a wrestler play Sabine Wren. With all due respect to Sasha Banks, I get it. She's got blue hair. She's super athletic, so she would probably rock an action sequence, which Sabine Wren would have to do. But Sabine was also a very nuanced character with a lot of depth to her. I would much rather see them go out and get a trained actress, somebody who could deliver the gravity of that and the weight of that and dye her hair blue and teach her what she needs or have a stunt double. You know, I, I, if you're going to bring Sabine Wren into the fold, just like Ahsoka Tano, that's uh, that's a character you really need to do a lot of justice by. So uh, don't don't know how I feel about a wrestler playing her. If indeed that's the way it's going to pan out, we saw a glimpse of Sasha Banks in the trailer. Don't really know what role she's going to play, so we're just going to have to wait and see. A lot of internet chatter that she's playing Sabine. Don't know how I feel about that. But as far as being pumped up for the series, 
all the way, son. Yes, sir. There are probably <laughs> few shows out there that I look more forward to than Mandalorian Season 2. Next to Rogue One, it is the greatest thing about Disney's acquisition of Star Wars that, that we have to come from that entire thing. And I would say more so than even Star Wars Rebels, which I really loved. To, uh, to help out and answer your question from earlier, the voice of the... Uh... The voice you were looking for from The Mandalorian is an actress named Emily Swallow, and you know her from Supernatural. She played Amara in Supernatural. Ah, uh, that's where, the voice that's came from. where that's I know so her. Yep, Absolutely. okay. All right. All right, the third question is going to be uh, Jake, not from State Farm, probably not wearing khakis when he wrote this. <laughs> Saw where FSU Miami nabbed a primetime slot on ABC next weekend. Is it just me, or does that game have the potential to be a total slop show especially on the Florida State end of things, uh, th- that hurts, Jake. Uh, mm. that, that hurts. A slop show? Yes, yes, there will be one team that has a slop. No. We, uh, <laughs> it, it's going to be interesting to see where these two teams progress from what happened on, on, on the first game of the year. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, we, on the Miami side of it, we had a lot of stuff we were working on trying to get into a new system, working out a new quarterback that hadn't done anything in a couple of weeks. There is the potential for it to be absolutely terrible, uh, but there's also a potential to see where these these two teams are when it comes to being in a primetime slot. Um, you know, Miami's going to play Louisville this week. We'll get a little more from them. I don't know who Florida State's going to lose to this week, but there's always that potential. Uh, uh, they will how- lose to no one. They're on a bye this week. So they were supposed to play, I think it was Sanford this weekend, and I forget what conference they're a part of, but they canceled all fall football. So that left Florida State with um, with a bye week. I, I don't know that I would speak so quickly about not losing this bye week, sir. I saw you guys play last week. <laughs> That's low, uh, man. That's really low. <laughs> That's below the belt right there. Well, on, in, in fact, on, in, in answering that question, I'd like to also add on uh, for Ian to, to add uh, an answer to my question as well. What's the over or under on Kleenex for you for next weekend? None. No, nah, none. I'm, <laughs> really, I'm not just saying that to be smug. I'm, I'm really not. I mean, listen, Mike Nervell and company inherited a bad football team. All right, Florida State football, you want to know what they are? I mean, what they truly are? They're a team full of losers, all right? And I don't say that as a derogatory, they're bad kids or they're bad people. I mean, they lose football games. That's all they've ever known. Kids who are on this team that are, you know, juniors, seniors, they've never known winning football at Florida State. When they step out onto the field and they get punched in the mouth and run into a little bit of uh, adversity, they fold. That's what they do. Uh, that's the primary reason why I don't understand why Mike Norvell went with James Blackman this past weekend because he's really kind of the personification of everything that is wrong with Florida State right now. A kid that has all the, the best of intentions in the world, but the minute he runs into a little bit of an obstacle, he reverts to everything that is bad. Bad mechanics, bad decision making, he freezes in the moment, he's not quick enough to make reads, to look downfield, he's looking for the rush. Granted, he's constantly running for his life because our offensive line is garbage, but you know, that is what Florida State football is. And then, oh, by the way, you know, Mike Nervell and, and Miami ran into this too. They're bringing in an all-new offensive system, new starting quarterback. You didn't get spring practice. You didn't get to practice through the summer. You didn't get voluntary workouts for kids to come in and practice with the new, new coaching staff. None of that happened. So that means basically these coaches are picking up from where they left off last year. And in Florida State's case, that was the Sun Bowl, which was a, a, just a nightmare. And Miami got blanked by who was it? Who'd you get blanked by? And uh, was it the the Yankee Bowl up there, in Yankee Saint Stadium? Mary, Saint Mary's in front. No, we we actually didn't play. We played in the that was Yankee Stadium was the year before that. We played over in Louisiana. Oh yeah, That's, the Independence, the the Shreveport, thriving metropolis, Shreveport. Yeah, the, the Independence the whoever's Bowl. Paying the, whoever's paying the most money uh, this year to sponsor this bowl game bowl is what we played in. And yes, we got we got beat by a terrible school. Uh, yeah. So, you know, much. I mean, the point is you've got <laughs> you've got massive overhauls of both coaching staffs that never got any time to install their stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I applaud you know, Manny Diaz in Miami. Uh, they had a very pedestrian effort last weekend against UAB, which is clearly should never be in the discussion with being close with Miami. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, but they did what they had to do and they won the football game. Uh, Florida yeah. State had really no business losing to Georgia Tech, even though for all the reasons I said, I, I knew they would be bad this year. Um, and Georgia Tech was picked to be the worst team in the ACC. 
I mean, good Lord, they're still trying to get rid of the Paul Johnson triple option offense, which is just a nightmare, which is why you still got kids running dirty blocks and cut blocks, which just about cost Joshua Kane to his knees. But, um, but I, I digress. Florida State's got a long road to hoe, man, long road to hoe. They've got to find a way to get better and win some games. Otherwise, they're going to get decimated on the recruiting trail. Yeah, well, we both have a long way to go on that. But, uh, next question, Marvin. Thank you, Marvin, uh, for an NFL questions. We can go to the next the next portion of this. From Cam in New England to Minshew Mania and Jacks, we had our fair share of NFL surprises in week one. What were your guys' biggest takeaways from last weekend, and what are you looking ahead to in week two? Ian, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um, like a lot of people, I really didn't tune into the NFL last week. Uh, I watched, I guess, about half to two-thirds of the Bucks saints game. You know, I've been a Bucks fan for years and years and years, dating back to – the days of uh, Sam Weish and Craig Erickson, uh, Horace Copeland and all those guys. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to not tune in whenever the Bucks are on TV. I've, I've been too invested in them for too long. Um, beyond that, though, man, I just, you know, I'd, I'm one of those people that is tired of having politics in my sports. I am. I go to sports like I do for books, man. I want an escape. And whether it's authors who beat ideology into their stories like a sledgehammer or whether it's in sports, if that's what you're going to give me, and that's your right as a, you know, as a private owned business to do, if that's what you want to do. Um, you know, I don't begrudge the NBA for putting black lives matter on the court or, you know, doing any of the other social stuff that their social justice stuff they're doing. It's their league. It's their business. You know, as, as a consumer though, I, I know what I'll dial into and what I want. And honestly, I've, I've, you know, I, I have kind of been falling out of love with the NFL for some time. And it's just, it's not the game that it used to be. I don't like the fact that the offenses are pretty well given carte blanche to do whatever they want to do nowadays. It's all about the quarterbacks. Um, running games are, are running backs are a dime a dozen now because, you know, that, that part of the game has really kind of fallen off. Um, I, I don't like the way that the NFL legislates its rules anymore. And, you know, I mean, I, I still care about it because I love football, but there's enough about the NFL that kind of turns me off that I just don't follow it with the microscope that I did when I was 25, 26 years old. Um, as far as stuff that, that broke away this weekend, I was rather surprised to see that the Jags won, <laughs> you know? I mean, I really feel for, uh, I really feel for Minshew. I think he is, um, he's a guy that everybody, the minute they got rid of Fournette and the minute they got rid of uh, uh, Yannick Ngakwe, it was all about, well, there's his tanking for Trevor. Like, it's right there in front of you. They didn't even <laughs> fire their crappy coach and general manager who's blown half the drafts he's been in. Like, they're keeping all of those bums and still expecting Jags fans to go buy season tickets. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Trevor Lawrence, welcome to Jacksonville. Well, you know, Gardner Minshew is a kid in his second year. It's not like he's a journeyman who's, you know, like Ryan Fitzpatrick who's played for half the teams in the league. Like he's a guy <laughs> who's just getting his start, and all he wants is an opportunity to be able to show that he belongs. So the fact that he stepped out there and led that team to a win, I, I doffed the cap, and I, you know, I certainly wish him well. Uh, Tyler Eifert plays tight end for the, uh, for the Jacksonville Jaguars, former North Carolina Tar Heel, first-round draft pick to the Bengals a number of years ago. Um, wore a logo on his helmet, um, memorializing a, a slain police officer from St. Louis. So I rubbed off the cap to that. You know, people who follow me on social media know I have a, a ton of respect for law enforcement. I spent a good four years of my career working four time, uh, four, uh, full time in that field as a civilian. And I just, I got a lot of respect for what those folks do every day and for not a whole lot of money. So uh, anyway, uh, Brady looks like he's already having words with Bruce Arians. I think that's cute. You know, Bruce Arians thinks for some reason he has the chops to be able to step out and criticize the greatest quarterback in the history of the league after one bad performance. Um, so I, I thought that was adorable. Uh, if I'm Tom Brady, I, that keeps up. I'll have him fired, and they will listen to Tom Brady. Um, definitely a little bit of a rocky start for the Colts. I did see where they, you know, they lost the game, so that's not what you do. Uh, Philip Rivers being Philip Rivers Philip there. Rivers being Philip Rivers. Looks like he's still the same one who was garbage last year in San Diego. Uh, and then uh, Cam Newton, you know, big trucking over there in New England. Still don't oh, know yeah. if he can throw the football, but 260 pounds to come get you some coming right up the line. <laughs> you know? So well, there you go. Yeah. 
But my biggest takeaways from this weekend is uh, Miami is still Miami and New England is still New England. So <laughs> that was those are the only two games I really paid attention to. I, I did watch the Colts game. Uh, Abby's a big Colts fan, being from Indy. I watched that with her. But yeah, watching a little bit of that. Uh, Miami's still Miami, and New England's still New England, and, and, and things aren't going to change a whole lot in the AFC East. We get Buffalo this week, so we'll see how that turns out. It's just a weird year for sports, man. I mean, regardless of, oh, yeah. of what you are, um, you know, I, I will doff the cap to uh, Tampa Bay Lightning, and we don't talk a lot of hockey on this show, particularly when Scott's not around because he's kind of our, our resident hockey guy. But, you know, kudos to him and kudos to his Tampa Bay Lightning, I read, where they made the Stanley Cup playoffs um, good friend of mine back home in Tallahassee, who's very, very plugged in with the sports world. I'm sure, you know, people who listen to the show are from Tallahassee, you know, who I'm talking about, um, his, one of his sons had, um, so you went through some, some pretty serious health issues a number of years ago and the entire sports community reached out to his family just to, to support him and their, you know, that family any way that they could. And from what I understand, the people down there who run the Tampa Bay lightning, they loaded that kid up. I mean, the minute he was able to come to a game, they had him in a box. He met players. He met coaches. They sent him autographed sticks, puck, posters. I mean, they went above and beyond to make a, a sick kid who was really fighting for some, you know, some hard fighting through some hard things feel, um, you know, feel feel that he's supported. And you always love to hear those stories. That's sports at its best. So, you know, while I'm not a, a huge Tampa Bay Lightning fan myself, I, you know, I respect that organization and stories like that will definitely make me root for them in the Stanley Cup finals. Um, but it's Absolutely. been a weird year for sports across the board, man, whether it's hockey, whether it's Major League Baseball, whether it's basketball, uh, you know, going to be interesting to see what college basketball looks like. They're apparently going to try and start that up here shortly. So it's a, it's a weird year, no doubt about it. All right. Our final, final dude mail question comes from Rachel. Uh, as a huge orphan black fan, I almost fell out of my seat this week when I heard that Tatiana Maslany, yep. hopefully I got that right, you did. Had, had landed the role of She-Hulk on Disney+. Plus. Do we have any kind of timetable on when to expect this series, and what are your guys' thoughts? Uh, I'm going to let Ian take all of this one, because <laughs> I, She-Hulk, the one thing I understood in that entire sentence was Disney+. Plus. So, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I listen... I, there's a reason why they make these shows because there's an audience out there for him, uh, for them. And I know, you know, she Hulk, I don't know a whole lot about that character. I know she is the cousin of Bruce Banner who got a blood transfusion for him. And through that, she adopted the, the Hulk gene or whatever you want to call it from the gamma. Uh, the, the difference is whenever she hulks out, she's still her. So she still has all of her intelligence, all of her personality, but she's just big and strong and green. Uh, I, you know, I'm kind of with Dave. Listen, I, I personally don't uh, have any real connection to that character. That's not one I'm going to line up to go watch. But I will tell you, I mean, if you're looking for a world-class actor to play a character, Tatiana Maslany is phenomenal. Uh, I got plenty of friends who watched Orphan Black. And for people who don't know what that show is, it was a British series about a, a, a clone operation. And so she, as the actress, had to play a number of different characters because they were all clones with their own different personalities cloned off of the same person. So as an actress, you talk about something that will really stretch your range. She's an incredible actress. So there's not a doubt in my mind, whatever she sets out to do, uh, she'll do a phenomenal job because she's really that, that great at her craft. Um, you know, I, Rachel, I leave she Hulk to you. I uh, hope it's great. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, you know, like we've say on this show and a good friend of mine always likes to say, there's a butt for every seat, man. So uh, while I'm geeked up for Falcon and Winter Soldier and Mandalorian season, Mandalorian season two, uh, you know there are people out there who are just as excited for She Hulk and WandaVision and some of the others. So good on them, man. That's uh, the awesome thing about superhero stuff and superhero affairs. There really is something out there for everyone, and uh, and that's that. So yeah, uh, as far as timetable on the show, I don't I don't think they have anything like that. Uh, they'll probably start writing it and shooting it maybe sometime next year. You get it 2022, 2023, somewhere along in there. Sounds good to me. And as we wind down the end of this, we're into the dude mail section. We're towards the end now. We're, we're closing up on the uh, the Dave Daniels spectacular Dudes in Hyperspace <laughs> podcast today. Uh, Garcon, white flag, please. White flag. All right, as you guys know, the white flag every week is how we close out the podcast. Uh, if you uh, want to know what we're excited about coming in, this is where we get into it. Uh, being the guest on the show today, Mr. Malone, I will allow you to go first. 
All right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's all about the NASCAR playoffs. Uh, well, naturally, I guess I should say I'm really excited to see how people like Detron City Vice, my brand new novel, which you <laughs> too can buy online at that Amazon.com place or by going to my website at ianjmalone.net. Um, so Dutch city vice, uh, seriously, guys, like I said before, you guys enjoy it. I, I hope you do. It puts a smile on your face. You want to raise a glass at the end and, uh, salute a bunch of old friends. That's, that's what those stories are. So I hope it rocks for you. Uh, NASCAR playoffs for me, very much where it's at. Uh, tonight is the Bristol night race. That is a crown jewel on the NASCAR calendar every year. Race fans really look forward to that one. Bristol is, you know, being a half mile high bank, short track gives, for my money, some of the racing that makes NASCAR NASCAR. You know, I mean, the the battling and the jockeying and the physicality that goes with that style of racing is just, as a fan, it is so much fun to watch. It was on display last night. My wife and I sat up and watched the Xfinity race with uh, Ross Chastain and Chase Briscoe and Austin Sendrick and those guys battling it out. You know, for those who don't really understand NASCAR, the Xfinity race, Xfinity series, kind of like AAA baseball for NASCAR. It's where you go. It's the last stop before you get to the big time, which is the Cup Series. So uh, Bristol put on an amazing show last night. I would expect tonight to be no different. It is also for the NASCAR playoffs, what's called a cutoff race. Uh, the NASCAR, you know, playoffs works in stages. So you have the first three races. You start with 16 drivers who are eligible for a title. At the end of that three races, you cut off the bottom three drivers. And then you race another three races, and then you cut off the next batch. And then you cut off, run another three races, you cut off the next batch, or I guess it's four drivers, until you get to the final four, which you run for all, you know, all the money and all the chips at the championship race at the end of the year. Tonight is a cut-down race. So Ryan Blaney, Matt DiBenedetto, possibly Clint Boyer. Uh, these are guys that, uh, particularly in the case of DiBenedetto and Ryan Blaney, their backs are against the wall. There is no, let me try and see if I can catch a break and finish fifth and maybe point my way or eke my way into the next round. They don't, they don't have enough to do that. They have to win. So there will be lots of gambling, lots of aggression. These guys are going to have to fight and claw to get to the front because that is the only way they advance. There is no tomorrow for them if they don't do that. So uh, a lot of great stories heading into tonight. And again, it's Bristol under the lights. I will tune into that, whether it's the playoffs or not, because it's just fun. But that's happening tonight at 7.30 on NBC Sports Network. So hopefully you guys enjoy. And as for me, I, my friend, am looking forward to the continued and weeping, the continued of weeping and gnashing of teeth, that happens every year for the last few years in the Miami Florida State Series. Being a Miami fan in Tallahassee, <laughs> I'm looking forward to next weekend, four years in a row. Uh, you know, I, if, if my team can't go and compete for a national championship, as long as we can beat Florida State every year and I can hold my head high, smile, and do everything that I do here, uh, I'm, I'm a happy man. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I, I think we're only going to be getting better this year as, as Derek King continues to become more comfortable in the system get the rust shaken off. Uh, Louisville's going to be an interesting game tonight, but obviously we always circle the Miami-Florida State game uh, for obvious reasons. That is what I'm looking forward to, is a continuation of domination by a bad Miami team over an even worse Florida State team. Uh, that's where I'm at, right there. The that, cream of the to. crap, as it there were. There you go. <laughs> All right, guys. We appreciate you guys coming in. Uh, We always appreciate five-star reviews wherever you get your podcast. Go on, rate us. Mr. Malone, this has been an interesting show. Indeed, sir. I have talked more than I ever have in my life on this podcast. And you did (laughs) an outstanding job. And you can have it back, sir. (laughs) See you guys on the next podcast. All right, see you guys.